Hello all. In today's session of parallel programming, we'll go for uh, the next topic, performance limits and profiling. Why are this two required? Why we want to know the limits of the performance and what is this profiling? So let, uh, let me take an example and tell you. Uh, assume we have developed some application. It can be an application or a software or a project, anything. So now you want this application to perform to the level you have set. So you want your performance of this application to the level set by the user. But because of some practical situations, you will not be able to reach uh, to this particular level set. So in order to reach to this particular level, we have to first of all identify what factors are affecting, what are the factors which are limiting your performance to reach to that particular level. And once I have identified the factors, the next one, what we need to do is we need to understand the profiling. Profiling here is nothing but you need to understand in depth about the behavior of the code which you have written. So if you are able to understand and analyze the code, you try to optimize the same thing. Once you are able to optimize the code and based on the factors you know which are limiting your performance, you try to make your application reach to the level which you have set. So in order to make an application work to the level set by the user, we need to first understand what factors are affecting the performance and how we can optimize the code. So we'll see both of them in detail in this today's session. Now, coming to the first one here, when you go for uh, performance limits and profiling, we have to first of all identify the applications. What are the potential performance limits? What are the limits for an application? Now, the basic limits here can be your memory bandwidth, so what do you mean by the memory bandwidth, the rate at which the data is transferred? So keep it in mind, we are dealing with parallel processing. So when I say a parallel processing, it is not the work done on a single system. It might be on multiple systems or multiple codes. So you need to be very much clear about the bandwidth. Similarly, one other factor or the other performance limit can be your memory latency. Latency here is nothing but the time required for the first byte to be transferred the time required to get the first byte of data the next one is your arithmetic intensity arithmetic intensity here is nothing but number of flop flop here is nothing but floating point operation flop stands for floating point operation so number of flops that are executed per memory operation and machine balance here is nothing but number of flops that are executed divided by the memory bandwidth. So these are the four major performance limits when I go for performance, uh, sorry, parallel processing application. Uh, the basic thing which we have to deal here is memory bandwidth. So when I go for memory bandwidth, the main problem for your memory bandwidth is non-contiguous memory access. What do you mean by contiguous memory uh, access? All the elements will be stored sequentially, then there is no problem. Whereas when I go for non-contiguous memory allocation, the elements are not stored sequentially. So there is no sequential organization of the data. The better example could be your linked list. So in this case, accessing the data from different memory locations may uh, lead to less performance of an application. So if you can just see this example here, 10, 20, 30 as to the user, they look as if they are stored sequentially. But if I go for non-contiguous memory allocation, this is my actual memory allocation. Memory allocation one is used. Here you are not storing anything. Here you are storing two. Meaning that when you are actually dumping this in array into the memory location, 10 is stored here, 20 is stored here. 30 is stored here. So they are not continuously stored. They are stored in different memory locations and with an interleaving of one gap in between, right? So you can even call this as strided memory access. Strided memory access is nothing but a gap between the memory access. So this you can call it as stride 2. Stride is equal to 2 because you are able to store the locations alternatively. So in memory bandwidth, the main problem will come when you go for non-contiguous memory allocation.
other than the four which have specified you even have some other operations or sorry some other performance limits where they can be floating point operations what kind of floating point operations are used what are the operations basic operations what is the instruction cache what networks are being used and what is the disk that is being used for storage of the memory so all these factors will be telling you uh, they will be limiting the performance of an application now when you have seen all these factors these particular limitations or the factors can be grouped under two categories one is your speed the other is your feeds speed is nothing but at what rate you are able to execute your operations so when i say op operations your flops ops all these comes under your speed but if i want to perform these operations i need to have some data right so that data here is nothing but feed so how you are able to get the data from the memory bandwidth the cache hierarchy network and disk so all the these three are being grouped under your feeds for an example and these group these can be grouped under your speed similarly the memory bandwidth automatic intensity depending on the operation you can either group them into speed category or your feeds category now we have seen what might be the factors that may be affecting the performance of a parallel application so when i say an application here when you are saying you are an application here what is that you are doing you have first identified the factors now uh, when where, when you have written this application where you will be actually executing on this on a machine right so after identifying the factors you need to even understand the hardware capabilities after writing an application whether you are able to execute this application perform you have it assume take, let us take a real world example you have written a program in a very good high level language but you are running it on a system with a minimum configurations so what will happen the speed or the execution time will be more because of this the performance of this particular program is being degraded so you need to even concentrate on your hardware in order to know get the better performance of an application now when you are going for determining the hardware capabilities we have to concentrate on three metrics one particular metric is your floating point operations the other is nothing but the memory bandwidth the rate at which the data is being moved and the other one is your energy one is your bandwidth the other is your energy consumption how many processes are being used and the other is the type of your operations so these three are the metrics in order to judge your hardware capabilities now uh, when you want to go for determine, determining your hardware capabilities these are the five important things you have to keep it in mind first you need to know what are the tools that are required how you calculate your flops what else how do you calculate your memory bandwidth and how do you calculate your uh, empirical uh, measurement and machine balance now when you go for the first one tools for gathering system characteristics we have two types of uh, operations that can be done one is theoretical calculation the other is empirical calculation theoretical calculation as the name implies you just provide an upper bound to an performance or you set up a goal you set a level right for theoretically but in practical condition what is the performance you are able to get it that is nothing but your empirical measurement so we see how we, we calculate the flops how we calculate the memory bandwidth memory bandwidth in both the cases whether you go for uh, empirical or theoretical we'll see this calculation measures and both of them put together will determine your hardware performance now coming to the tools here i know before executing an application on your system you want to just know the configurations of the systems how well the system will be working so this is nothing but a graphical view of your system of a particular linux system so this is your machine uh, what are the different levels of cache memory that are available and how many cores are present in the system and the capacity against each of them so this is giving a graphical overview of the hardware on which you will be executing your application and this you will be able to get it by using ls topo 
on a Linux system. Similarly, if you want to know the details of your systems in terms of a text view, that also can be done by means of LSPCI. So see here, it starts with the architecture, what is your CPU register bit, how many cores are present, the different configurations of your memory all will be given in detail to you. Now having seen the tools, right? Now uh, I already told you we have theoretical calculation of flops and man width and empirical. So now when you go for theoretical calculations of maximum floating point operations, they are nothing but number of cores into the clock speed. Generally it will be represented in gigahertz and the number of flops per cycle per core. So since we are dealing with parallel processing, we'll be using a processor with multiple cores, multiple core. So each core is capable of performing an operation. So let me take an example here. We have four cores, each operating at 3.0 gigahertz and four flops per cycle per core. So when I multiply all the values, you will be getting the number of theoretical flops that can be executed by a machine. So here in terms of hardware, you are calculating how much performance can be given by the system. Now, the next one is we'll go for calculating theoretical bandwidth. So before going for calculating the theoretical band memory bandwidth here, we'll see here. For example, you are at a higher most level where the data can be stored in main memory or it can be stored in the registers. So it means that you are able to store it in a CPU. So when you see the number of cycles that are required here, it requires only one cycle to access the data. It requires four clock cycles for getting the data present in level one cache. This is your level two cache, level two cache, where it requires 10 cycles. So as you are moving away from the CPU, the number of cycles, so the amount of time required for accessing the data will be increased. So it means that it is better the data is present in the CPU rather than it is present in your main memory. So this is related to your first part is memory hierarchy. Now we'll see how to calculate the memory bandwidth. So when you want to go for calculating the memory bandwidth, it is the rate at which the data is being transferred. This is your memory channels, the number of memory channels, the number of bytes per access, TW and NS is nothing but sockets. So when you just see this pictorial representation, CPU may be, here it is an example of two sockets. So depending upon the number of uh, core elements, CPU1 and CPU2, this can be stored as two core, dual core processor, where you have two sockets. So depending on that, you can calculate the theoretical bandwidth. So theoretical bandwidth is a practical calculation. Depending on the values, ideally you are doing it. Now, having seen the theoretical calculation, now we'll go for empirical measurements of both the bandwidth and the flop. Flop is floating point operations. And for bandwidth, you know the memory hierarchy starting from your main memory to the CPU. And here we go for using two tools. One you call it as stream benchmark, the other you call it as roofline model. So when you go for stream benchmark and a roofline, this is for your roofline. This is your roofline model, which gives you a graphical representation. Graphical representation. So this horizontal line will tell you about the flop operations, number of flop operations of the applications that are executed. And each of these sloped line will tell you about the bandwidth. So depending upon the cache levels, here it is L3, L2, L1. So depending on the level of cache you are using, this tells you about the bandwidth and this tells you about the flops. And stream benchmark here is nothing but it just gives you the text view of the data. Text view of the data and in detailed, in detailed in the sense, for a given up, uh, instruction, it tells you how many bytes are required, what are the arithmetic operations that are being required. So it gives you in detailed operations of each and everything. Whereas here in graphical view of a roofline model, it just gives you the high level view of the data. So stream benchmark and roofline model can be used in practical situation where you want to know uh, what is the performance of an application. Now, having seen the theoretical as well as the empirical calculations, 
will go for seeing the machine balance between the flops and the bandwidth. Now you have calculated the flops, you have calculated the bandwidth. So machine balance here is nothing but theoretically if I go for, this is flops calculated theoretically divided by the bandwidth and if I go for empirical, this is flops divided by the bandwidth. We'll cover the next topic in the next class.